Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for the great presentation and the insights that we have understood now about AI and AI inventing or creating inventions, hopefully, and how this could impact AI, our logistics, especially how uh, logistics, the, the industry itself, is very important here in the country. Um, I might start with you, Vishal, by asking, you've made a big claim saying $1 trillion. Yes, the logistics industry is a very big industry. Have you thought through what are the immediate steps that are needed to unlock such a potential? Yeah, so I think absolutely. And uh, one of the key uh, focus out here is uh, we've recently been invested into uh, by uh, uh, QA and Nagel, which is one of the world's largest uh, sort of a supply chain and logistics industry. And uh, to be able to sort of unlock the entire value, one of the key aspects is for these logistics companies and supply chain companies to agree on a data schema. Because what's happening is there's a lot of information loss between one sort of company to another. So what we should be able to do is, if we agree on uh, common data standards, data flow will be actually uh, much more smoother to unlock that value. And I'll give you an example. Uh, the entire... Uh, global supply chain industry really moves on two platforms, pallets and containers, yeah. right? But at the same time, uh, we realized once we started working uh, with it is that the people who manage the pallets don't talk to the people who manage the containers. Uh, people who build products, put them onto the pallets, don't talk to the pallet providers and so on and so forth. And if you can start to essentially sort of bridge that and have a common platform to work, I think it's going to unlock massive model value. We all understand that standards if you apply them, would uh, mean that intellectual property or some aspects of intellectual property cannot be filed. Yeah. Do you see any hindrance to the business that you are in, as an example, to create a standard? So I think there's always going to be trade-off. Uh, however, I think that by increasing the size of the pie, you'll be able to unlock a lot more value. Again, taking the example from the mobile phone industry, yeah. in the uh, 1980s, you had about five or six different standards for the uh, mobile phone industry. Japan had their own. US had three different standards at that time, digital amps and CDMA. Uh, Europe had uh, two standards. So I think there were about six or seven standards. And the industry was highly fragmented. But since the standardization came about with the start of uh, you know, GSM and then the GSMA, uh, we wouldn't have ever had this mobile phone industry at the scale without the standardization. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, Professor Ryan? Uh, in your opinion, why are their AI-generated inventions important for the industry? Why do you feel that it is important to create the framework for, for patenting them, essentially, or copywriting them? Well, I think it's important for any industry that's using AI and, and that depends on intellectual property protection because AI is becoming increasingly involved in the R&D effort and increasingly autonomous in the R&D effort. And industry may not yet have come to terms with how this is going to affect how they're going to protect products and how they're going to commercialize products. Can you maybe give us an example here to help? Sure. So for example, in the life sciences industry, in drug development, if you have an AI that's picking the new targets you want to go after, if it's repurposing existing drugs, if it's selecting antibodies out of a library, if it's modeling clinical trials and finding benefits to drugs. These are the sorts of things you file patents on, and it isn't really necessarily clear there how you go about protecting something like mm -hmm. that, right? In the absence of these laws, companies, the, the prevailing advice has been one of two things. One is just put someone down, and this is rarely challenged because inventorship is not challenged in a patent application, usually outside of litigation, mm -hmm. and most patents aren't litigated. Or two, um, um, uh, sorry, I forgot number two was, but we'll go with number Oh, sorry, number two was deliberately insert someone in the inventive process. Yeah. So even if you could have an AI doing something autonomously or doing something more effectively than a person, you essentially have to contaminate the process with a person, right? And neither of those strategies are probably good for innovation. I similarly think it's important for the government, including the UAE government, to be thinking about, well, as this is coming up, what sort of law should we have that will most incentivize innovation, that will most make this a jurisdiction that is uh, thriving with innovation? 
And even if it isn't absolutely critical to do right now, it is going to be critical in maybe five or 10 years. And now's the time to be having this discussion and to make sure the right frameworks are in place. Do you see any glimpse of hope in any specific region in the world that is uh, trying to uh, take the first steps in, in, in drafting these laws or you, you feel not enough effort is being put until now? I think that really just in the past couple of years, in the past couple of months, there's been a dramatic change in the way people have been talking and thinking about this. So the, the World Intellectual Property Organization just had a meeting of their member states about AI and IP. There's a growing understanding that AI and IP is kind of central to the future of commercialization of a lot of industry and technologies. And indeed, the US Patent Office, instead of backing off this and saying, you know, we don't need to deal with this and there's always a human inventor and this isn't going to be an issue for 50 more years has said you know actually let's take a step back let's get comments from industry from academia from other governments and see how do we go about creating new policies that are really going to incentivize innovation uh, Vishal have you interacted with IP intellectual property do you have any opinion based as, as you're a practitioner of, of uh, AI in, in, in the field of logistics yeah, I mean, sure. So I, I, of course, don't have uh, Ryan's expertise and experience on the subject. Uh, so in my very limited experience, essentially, there are two aspects uh, from a patent application. First of all, uh, you have to have a notion of some sort of an instrument being sort of created, and that has a value around it, which you have to explain as a part of the patent application. Uh, I don't know if uh, AI systems are yet able to recognize that. Hmm. Uh, what is the instrument or what's the value that's created and mm. they don't because they don't really have an inherent understanding of value yet yeah. and the second bit is uh, of course you know kind of Ryan's uh, point in if you have sort of algorithm sort of a generating uh, the IP where does it sit so uh, because it, you know, my information is still uh, probably not up to date uh, is essentially you have this notion that whoever owns the equipment mm. on which you create the IP owns the IP, and yeah. hence the companies are very careful that their staff members only do work on their own laptops or, or computers mm. versus their kind of personal ones, because mm. there have been cases in the past where somebody has worked on their personal computers, mm. and hence they own the IP. Okay. So I think we have to be careful with that. So I don't know if the algorithm runs on my computer, then it's mine, or it's the company's computer. I don't yeah. know what Ryan thinks about it. Well, it's tricky. It depends on what sort of intellectual property protection you're aiming at. Sure. So at least in the UK, it's the case that if someone does something within the course of their employment and they use employer resources, and in the US, it's largely like this too, the employer owns the IP, okay. right? And so in the absence of a clear rule, like can you get a patent on this? Can you copyright these things? Companies can also rely on trade secrets. So if an AI is generating all sorts of valuable things, if it's generating lots of usable data that has commercial value, one of the best ways to protect that is just to keep it secret. You don't share it outside the world and then yeah. no one else can use it. Yeah. But there are challenges to keeping things secret. Mm. Fair enough. Since we have some limited time, I'd love to open up the floor for any questions from the audience. No intellectual property fans? I see a hand in the back. Yes. There. Yeah. points. The question I actually had was regarding the algorithms and whether um, copyright would protect the algorithm by itself or the complete product or the complete unit which is composed of that and many more. So the reason I asked this question is because recently they've been talking about protecting DNA. So would the same apply here or not? Thank you. Well, there's a lot of very interesting IP issues surrounding AI, right? And probably the one that's, the issue that's of most interest to industry is how do you protect AI itself with intellectual property? And that's something people have been debating fairly vigorously since the 1980s. And we're seeing a renewed round of interest in whether or not you can patent AI. A as a general matter, you can copyright AI, right? So AI is generally software. There's source code, there's object code, yeah. there's other potentially types of copyrightable things. And all of that, when you write it, is protected by copyright. The challenge with protecting software with copyright is that copyright protects the expression of ideas and not ideas. 
And so usually you can look at how someone's software is functioning and you can rewrite the code and obtain something equivalent that doesn't infringe someone's copyright and that's why people want a patent on it. Of course, AI that today is often relying on training with data sets and machine learning and deep learning is a little bit different because the source code may not be the most valuable bit. The data you use to train AI may be the real source of value and data per se is usually not something you can protect by copyright. So I think there's a complex approach to how you protect these things. The short answer is AI could be protected by copyright, but the output isn't necessarily protected by copyright if there isn't a human author of it, depending on what jurisdiction you're in. Uh, I'd like to thank the panel for their time today and thank you for attending the session. Yep. One more question. One more question. Perfect. Yeah, so hand, yes. Yeah. Um, you might have answered part of this question already, but I'm going to go ahead and ask it anyway. But um, we've been using computer algorithms for many years now to solve problems. And um, we've never had this problem of having to um, figure out how to patent the work that software developers have been doing all along. Why is it different with AI? There is a team or a software developer always behind the scenes who's creating the AI algorithm. Why is it different now? Well, one version of it is this hasn't come up in a conflict now because these issues are rarely litigated, but it isn't to say it's a new problem. I'd say it's becoming more of a problem as AI is becoming more autonomous. And yes, there is always someone who builds an AI and programs an AI. But building and programming an AI doesn't mean that you have anything to do really with the AI's particular output solving a particular problem. I mean, some of the time, absolutely. Most of the time, someone designs software to solve a particular problem. Maybe they're an inventor of a problem. But in patent law, to qualify as an inventor, you have to have devised of the actual output of something. And so if you or a group of people are building a piece of software that has functionality, and someone else is using this and giving it problems to solve, and someone else is looking at the answers. That doesn't mean the people who program the software are patent inventors on its output. Uh, if I may just uh, you know, yeah. kind of add to that very good point, is if I just take a practical example of what's happening in our world. Uh, so what we are really generating, uh, or, or, or what our platform generates, is decisions uh, in the end uh, for a company to take some actions. So we work in the financial market, in the case of asset management, our platform generates buy, sell, hold decisions. And the example I gave you, uh, the decision is every day in this very dynamic environment, how many trucks to send to which retailers to kind of pick up the stock. Now, there are uh, different layers to it. Uh, at the layer, which is on our company side, is essentially the platform, which has the tooling uh, where the algorithms sit uh, and which we try to classify as, as an instrument which we protected with the uh, uh, patents that we have filed. On the layer on top of that is the data that's actually coming in, and we use that data to train the uh, uh, AI models to be able to make that decision. Now, the data and the decisions that we made for that is pertinent to that customer or the client or the part of the process inside the organization that's adding value. Now, that belongs to our uh, clients, and that's we don't take any uh, claim for any of the IP around it because it's essentially their stuff. Uh, so I think so that's the framework in which we sort of deal with, and it's a bit different from the uh, traditional framework, and also to understand where the boundary is between the algorithm itself, which is part of the tool chain, versus the actual uh, output decision-making models yeah. that are coming yeah. on the other side. So it's, it's good to have a fine-tune, but there'll be you know, lots of sort of ambiguity around it all the time, yeah. and that's why we need people like Ryan. <laughs> Perfect. I think we have one more question. Yes. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, it's a wonderful and interesting uh, forum. Thank you so much. I would like to thank uh, all of you here. My question is um, related to uh, one of my participants here asked, suppose we have the professional license for each of these AI professionals who do the machine learning, and it can be registered internationally 
and nationally, will that solve many of our problems with related to intellectual property? Suppose we have a globally uh, kind of uh, institution which recognizes each of these AI professionals who get registered there and have a collaborative revenue sharing model in case of some innovative breakthrough. Do you think this can really work out and help us in the future? Is there anything existing right now where the AI professionals? Professor. I mean. I think she's talking, you're talking I think about a new business model of sorts of or, sharing. Or when you say profession, AI uh, I mean, okay, the, professionals, the, the, you mean the, the, you the, could the, register AI systems and then have their inventions pay into sort of a public um, pool of benefits? Each of these people who are involved in machine learning and they would like to come out with a creative idea. So if they are granted a license and a register number, hmm. do you think uh, they would solve most of the problems where the company doesn't get to have the whole portion of their creativity? Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. Sure, well, it's a very interesting proposal. I, I worry about a couple of things with it. One is increasing compliance costs. So it seems to me there would be a lot of administrative overhead in having people register for this and in challenges in um, figuring out how to allocate the benefits for it. I mean, generally with private enterprise, we've had companies applying for patents and you know, choosing how to commercialize them and then the benefits from this have been passed on to consumers who are paid in taxes to the state and thus distributed that way. And I think that's been a fairly effective model. I think that the best way to do this sort of thing, to the extent we want to encourage companies to build inventive AI, to generate more innovation, is to allow them to still have the same sorts of incentives to place so that they can have patent protection on important new things coming out and that they will, in the same way they do in the private market, share the benefits that way. But there's a lot of other ways you could do it. You could say, no, no one gets these things protected and inventions will go into the public domain and everyone will enjoy them. You could even register AI systems and have benefits stemming from them going into public systems, but um, I, I'd suggest sticking with a, a system we know works fairly well and has less overhead. Perfect. Thank you.